Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. We're doing global connections here. We're trying to understand the world as it is and maybe likely the world as it should be. Uh, Russell Liu, an old friend who has been on Think Tech many, many times. Uh, Chang Wang. Chang Wang, did I say that right, Chang? Yes, you're right. Okay. And Alexander Morawa. Mor Mor Morawa, yeah. And uh, Russell, I'm going to leave it to you to give a, a more full introductions. Uh, to these two individuals. Aloha, Jay. Good, good, uh, good afternoon. I'd like to introduce um, two really uh, distinguished speakers today joining us, Alexander Marawa. He's an international legal counsel and a law professor um, with extensive practice and knowledge um, of European law, as well as American law. He's taught in also in China. So he has a very unique perspective, very multilateral perspective. And next to we also have uh, Chang Wang. Chang Wang is a practicing lawyer um, in the United States, uh, presently um, practicing out in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I turn it back to Jay and I'm Russell Liu, um, uh, also a lawyer uh, and a professor. And I um, have been in China for the past 18 years as well in the US. Mm, what an esteemed group we have here. Well, let's tackle it. You know, the first thing is, uh, you know, when we looked after World War II, the United States was emerging as a leader of uh, a liberal world order. Um, and that has changed in recent years. Uh, I think it was changing before Trump, but it certainly has accelerated. The change has accelerated. And a lot of people feel it's a negative change under Trump. Um, and today we're gonna focus on exactly how that change has worked. And since we have the benefit of Alexander's European experience, we can talk about not only China, but we can talk about Europe as well. Uh, so I guess what I'd like to know, Russell, from you is uh, what is the state of the world order these days? And my second question is gonna be, what is the state of the dipl diplomatic relations between the United States and China these days? Okay, I think with regards to these questions, first, I, I might really ask to pass over to Alexander just to say a little bit of the perspective globally, um, because he has that European perspective, as well as America, and he's also taught in China. And then I'll, I'll, I'll coming back to me, I'll talk about that specific, the US China relationship. So maybe Alexander, you can fill in some of your thoughts. I, Sure, gladly. I mean, uh, the United Nations usually uses the interesting phrase, we are deeply concerned when something is not right. I think that phrase would really apply in the situation right now. Uh, China certainly is just one part of a, of a much more multifaceted and broader uh, international system that is, has, has uh, bilateral but multilateral levels as well. I think the position in the United States definitely is weaker and it's weaker because we decided, or our leadership for the past, past four years decided to withdraw from a lot of constituent elements that really make up that system. Uh, if you look at the interaction with the United Nations, for instance, which is of course the biggest international organization, uh, we have pulled out of uh, organizations, sub-organizations there uh, where we should have been in. I mean, WHO is an example. They could have been very helpful in coordinating the coronavirus response. We pulled out instead of cooperating. WTO for trade disputes. We blocked the um, restaffing of the appellate body in WTO so that adjudication is not working anymore. I think we're causing more problems by pulling out. And that reflects on bilateral relations, of course, which thrive in a, in a stable environment. We, we're talking trade much here. Trade only works if the environment is stable, if the legal basis for doing business is stable. If not, it suffers. Well, well so let me ask you, I mean, is it, is it in the interest of the world in general to have uh, a country like the United States act as act and you know, take the role, uh, so to speak, of, of a global leader? Does that benefit the world, the world order to have that happen? Sure, I mean, especially if we are moral leaders too. Uh, leadership by bullying doesn't work usually. Leadership by example, and then Biden is, is using that phrase quite a bit, works quite well. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's imperative really, and, and that speaks a little bit for China, plus the EU, plus others, if there is more than one leader. I think the existence of multiple leaders that can play roles is quite important. It's more of a give and take. Diplomacy is always multilateral. So I think we should not try to be the leader in every respect. 
Uh, in some respects, that's helpful too. Again, if we come with the moral backing and the integrity that allows us to have standing, not just because we have troops to uh, enforce our leadership. Yeah, one other thing about that is uh, what 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 is uh, what is our interest in being the world leader? Does it help us? And losing our leadership the way we have, how, what effect does that have on us on the United States? The broadest question you can ask, if you have about six hours, we can dive a little bit into it. Uh, not being the world leader is a good thing too. I mean, at, at times in history, we decided to pull out and say, we will not engage, we will not necessarily be the policemen of the world. Uh, that was not necessarily a disaster either, except of course, two world wars happened at that time, which pulled us right back in. Uh, so I think it is crucial to to have a seat at the table. If you if you uh, if you're not part of the overall progress of international relations, if you're not playing, you will only be an observer. That's the biggest risk, I believe. And we have seen that sometimes that we were kind of sidelined and people would just uh, make decisions without the United States being properly represented and being able to voice our position. So that definitely is a damage. And if you look at trade relations, that's ultimately a financial damage. And who is ultimately paying the price for tariffs? It's not China, it's not the federal government, it's not the corporations, it's the customers. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, I guess, would you agree with me, Alexander, that the worst thing a given country can do is try to be, um, or try to continue to be a world leader and do it badly? and have little wars all over and come and go and, and make the wrong decisions diplomatically, make the wrong decisions uh, in terms of uh, military presence. Would you agree with me? Sure, I think we have to distinguish between making mistakes, which everybody makes, including uh, leaders in, in uh, the, at the nation, national level or the international level, and systemic um, miscalculations or systemic errors that are based on the lack of knowledge and, and understanding. I think when you talk about China-US relations, much of it is, is a misunderstanding that's cultural and historical as much as it's a legal problem. Um, if you just make mistakes, you can fix that. And I think Biden's program, if you look at what he says on his platform is, we will not be able to fix everything right now. We will come back and we'll re-engage diplomatically uh, we will use uh, the international system to be present. We will also be there to listen, not just to talk and, and try to make everybody see what we are coming from or where we are coming from and what we want. Isn't, isn't really, isn't that the, uh, the biggest challenge? Uh, yes, to come back, but, but to uh, do it in such a way so that other countries will have us back. Uh, you know, that's not a necessarily a foregone conclusion. Uh, you can try to come back and find that nobody wants you back, uh, which I think uh, is a great risk for this country right now. Do you think we can come back? Do you think Biden can achieve that? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm a natural born optimist. I think he can. It's not just him. It's the new administration. It's ultimately all of us. We have to collaborate on this. I believe. Uh, the, the crucial thing behind all this is trust. I mean, have we lost trust? Uh, when you travel to Europe, as an example, um, during the past several years, people would look at you and say, oh, you're from America, how is it like to live there now? And my answer was, well, we still breathe oxygen and we eat three times a day, what do you, what do you mean? No, I mean, live with a person like your president and, and with the policy decisions that he makes. Uh, my answer was, you know, look at behind that. We are still in many ways the same nation that was actually this beacon of hope and that, you know, trailblazer when it comes to constitutional rights and the trailblazer when it comes to, if necessary, intervening and helping our allies. We are still there, but there is much in front of it. There's a whole facade of not that in front of it. So we need to overcome that. Uh, my, 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 I guess in sarcastic remark is, we can only project trust in us to the outside when we trust ourselves, including our institutions, that they actually work. Uh, let me be optimistic again. I think the last five weeks have actually shown that several parts of the federal system and many parts of the state system function reasonably well. Look at the judiciary, right? The judiciary stepped in and made decisions that were really based on what we call the rule of law and due process. 
So yes, we can say problems happen, but we're still a beacon because we have this, we still have it. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, so Russell, can you compare that discussion we just had with Alexander uh, to the relationship we started out here with China and how it has done, that relationship has done over the past four years? Well, just a quick add to when uh, Alexander said people in Europe ask him, what's it like in America? That's the question I get in China. What's it like in America these days? I get that question all the time and um, I have a similar response. But again, what the specific state of the US-China relationship? Well, you know, Biden inherits a lot of legacy issues now. Um, the reality, um, things are uh, set at a point where uh, prior to um, the present uh, Trump administration, the uh, US policy was of engagement. Um, after Trump uh, ramped it up a different policy, the three C's, compete, counter, and contain. And that whole policy is set by the uh, Trump administration made China a strategic competitor, and uh, to a large extent, um, they were casted uh, as an ideological threat. So that caused China to take on, uh, in response to that, a very different policy. Um, and a lot of it, I think what, what Alexander said is correct, is there's a cultural dimensions here, probably that many Americans don't understand, unless you've been in China for a while. Um, but it's similar to what's in Hawaii, Jay. It's sort of like this as a lawyer. When you go to litigation, you go to trial, you have to leave some room for face so that people can craft some kind of settlement. When you get pushed back to your wall, um, as in the Asian culture, you lost face. There is no room. You have to come back strong as you are. You have to get your respect. That's more important, you know? And Jay, I remember when I first lessons in China, I had, a, I had this cleaning service come to me. Uh, they took my money, and, but they went bankrupt. And you know what they did? They came to me, and every customer, and bowed to me and said, I'm sorry, I'm in Chinese, uh, and very ashamed, you know? So again, there's a face issue. So I, again, how, how we have uh, encountered China in the last four years has been one of a, a real, uh, uh, dynamic, uh, uh, cultural uh, miscues, cultural mistakes. We, we did a zero sum game. And so now that's what Biden faces, you know, and not only that, the relationship with China, it's also, um, it, it, there's also the political reality that within the US, um, you know, Trump lost, um, Biden received 5.8 million more votes. Trump had 73.5 million votes. So it's going to be very hard for Biden to reset a lot of the, the policies created by this president administration, at least not immediately. The tariffs, he's going to have to probably keep that in place. There's a there's the trade war, the tech war. Um, again, th we've seen that ratched up. Um, and again, uh, there are all these issues that are, are really popping up. Um, so these are a lot of things that has set the stage for a very different transition for very difficult for Biden, you know, to um, transition to. And getting back to what Alexander said, I think one of the one approaches is that probably Biden will have to reach out to the allies. Um, he, needs a he needs a leverage relationship. And if he gets the allies on the same page uh, and if he's reasonable with China, maybe we'll start to see something happen. But there, there has to be some kind of engagement at some point. The question is when and how he's gonna do that. Um, how he's no. gonna approach China. China takes two to tango. And I think both, both uh, the speakers before you have touched on one very interesting thing, is you can judge the United States by what its government, uh, ergo its president uh, does, um, or you can have a conversation with people like you guys. And uh, you can say, you know, what, what's in your mind, Russell? What's in your mind, Alexander? How do you feel about China? Or how do you feel about um, the US? Um, and, and, and the answer is, you, if you answer that individually, you would say, I don't agree with what the government has done. They have not done a good job. Um, and then you have, to, you have to advocate to try to convince the person on the other side, whether it be from Europe or, or from China and Asia, um, that you are the real United States. You are the real deal. And the government is not the real deal. But as Russell points out, Gee whiz, we had 70 odd million people vote for Trump. So it's hard to make the argument. 
what argument would you make in order to demonstrate that the real United States is different than what Trump is doing? If I answer this question, let me just to share this imaginary conversation between Washington and Beijing. And Washington, after January 20th, 2021, Washington says to Beijing, let's reset, let's talk, let's rebuild our relationship. And Beijing answers, why should I trust you? And we made progress under Obama four years ago, and then everything was destroyed in the past four years. Washington said, but America is back, let's talk. And Beijing said, Obama is what America pretended to be. Trump is what America really is. Washington replied, but, but both Obama and Trump are America. And Beijing said, okay then, why do I want to deal with a bipolar personality? Schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, sw you swing and from this personality to another personality every four years, why do I want to do that? And if we agreed on something and everything could be trashed four years later. And Washington said, oh, but that exactly is what democracy works. See, if you, we imagine this conversation and we can understand how difficult the relationship is right now. And when we talk about the relationship, it's two-way relationship. It's not simply you can just, uh, okay, I abandoned you, I humiliated you, I trashed you, now I'm going to, uh, I change, and then let's restart. It doesn't work that way. And we hear this again and again, that the current US policy toward China enjoy a bipartisan consensus. So this rhetoric is being told by the departing Trump officials and being accepted by the media as fact. You know, everything will, will continue the Trump route. I doubt it, because we don't know what Biden-China policy will look like. From the appointments of Tony Blinken and uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, we can have a basic idea how the Trump administration plan to do with China. But we have to be very cautious of presuming that Biden will continue whatever Trump has put in place, the China policy, which is a fiasco to put it mildly. The most distinct characteristic of the China policy for the past four years, or the Trump administration policy in general, is arbitrary and capricious. The reason it's arbitrary is capricious because it's a lack of empathy. Empathy is what, what Obama believed is a fundamental skill for a politician, which you can put yourself in the shoes of other people and to understand how other people think and feel, then you can have a relationship. If you do not, if you are not capable of empathy, you can't feel and understand other people and you can't build another relation, a, a relationship, a real relationship. So you're, we, talking, you're, you're talking about the relationship between the government of the United States and the government of China. But, you know, Trump has, uh, has, has, has demonstrated that he can, he can bring divisiveness to any relationship. He can divide people so well. Look what he's done in this country at so many levels in so many ways. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it's hard to say that there is unanimity um, about, about China in the United States. Uh, that there's a lot of distrust now uh, about China in the United States, more, more significantly more than there was before. <laughs> it, it's also very interesting that he's created this special relationship with Russia, where a lot of people in this country who were suspicious of Russia before, now they trust Russia, which is ridiculous. Um, but my point, my point though, is that he has created distrust among a lot of people in this country of China. And I would guess, and maybe you have some thought about this, that that has created distrust in China about the yeah. United States. So very, he's created very, a rift between the two countries, no? Very well said, but um, may I just add, you know, for the past four years, there's 
China benefited from Trump administration. Uh, in November 20, 2016, the first reaction, it was about 11 p.m. In, uh, on no, uh, November 8th, when the, it was abundantly clear Trump would be reelected, would be reelected as a 45th president of the United States. And my, my first reaction, I can tell you, was the Communist Party of China will be there forever. And because it's like a God sent to, to the to uh, the Chinese authority that this uh, the old argument Chinese government has been trying to persuade the public that the American style democracy doesn't work. And uh, the election of Trump and the four years of Trump administration basically provide abundant evidence to the Chinese authority that don't learn from the United States. That democracy is very messy and it doesn't work, doesn't fit China. So the, for the past four years, if we if we do not we do not know exactly the intent of the, the China people on the Trump administration, Peter Navarro, all these people, what they really want to do. But if they want to weaken the Chinese authority, they they miserably failed the job because for the past four years, China's authority and credibility among its own people has been significantly stressed. Interesting. You know, one of the one of the um, uh, underlying th thoughts of this conversation, Alexander, is that is that um, we expect people to understand that democracy is tumultuous, and that there's a change in power every so many years. In in this case, uh, for the United States, the leader of democracy, if you will, um, you know, everything changes every four years, and you can have a very abrupt, um, uh, disruptive change of power in this country. And, and I think, um, you know, there's two sides that I would ask you about. Number one is, um, do people in this country understand uh, the need um, to have a smooth change of power uh, in order to look better and, and interact better with the rest of the world? And two is, um, you know, uh, it's too bad, is it not, that a lot of countries out there don't fully appreciate the vagaries, uh, you know, what did de Tocqueville say, the, the tumultuousness of American democracy. Um, they should perhaps understand better, you know, that you, you get that. It's one of the characteristics, you get that, you're always going to get it. But the third thing I would offer you to ask, to ask you is that, wait a minute, <clears throat> is this really uh, an inherent part of democracy to be tumultuous? Is it really uh, necessary? Uh, can't we do better? I mean, in a funny way, uh, China doesn't have this problem, as, as Chang mentioned. Um, you have leadership that's going to last for a while. Um, and there isn't that kind of tumultuousness. And there's a continuity, a consistency in policy that we should be envious about. And maybe we should take a, a hard look at that and try to achieve that, maybe change the way we look at our own democracy. What do you think? Yeah, that's another wonderful question to sort of do an entire tour of philosophy, political science, and law for the last 250 years. I think if you go back uh, to the founders, they would probably have woken up every day in the morning and said, this will be messy. And it will be messy for the foreseeable future or forever, actually. That's why they put all these um, checks and balances in the Constitution. That's why they put all the fallback options, the uh, diversions, and all these things in there the legal uncertainties the constitution is one of the shortest in the world if you look at modern constitutions they beat the u.s constitution by thousands of percent in use of words they left a lot open and i think part of the design really is this kind of tumultuous reality that happens and i would say 90 percent of the time democracy can and probably even should be a little bit tumultuous because it's a give and take between different opposing positions uh, in the political spectrum, that's what it is. But then there's some areas and the transition is probably the most important one. The second most important one I believe is the Supreme Court where stability has to be there otherwise the, the entire building collapses. Those are foundation stones. If, if those are entangled, if those are dragged into the tumultuous reality, then we have a problem. The Supreme Court with a surprising degree of sovereignty actually rejected this. Many of the lower courts with the same dignity rejected this attempt. So they kept out of this quite successfully. The transition process, surprisingly enough, and I think much credit goes to Biden, 
he did not respond to every single thing, right? He, when necessary, sent legal teams to argue his position, sometimes did not. But you didn't see him every day on, on the platform, you know, countering any argument that came out of Trump, Giuliani, or any other person that was involved in this. So that level of dignity, I think, also helps us understand that this is actually going well. Compare, I mean, we are we're sometimes a little bit in a bubble. We just look at what we are doing. If you look at Europe, right? Look at Italy for a moment. They had periods of time when there were eight or nine different governments every year. They collapsed after a month or less. And then they had new elections and then somebody else came in and they also collapsed. Italy is still there. If you look at other continents, which we sometimes don't look at enough, I think specifically Africa, when we talk US-China relations, Africa will be a dramatically important area that we have to look at. Uh, dictatorships, democracies would switch all the time, sometimes with bloodshed. So is that ideal? Absolutely not, because they were missing the cornerstone of a peaceful order transition. So that's where I'm really coming back to. Transition and judicial oversight really are the ones, the, the two elements in a democracy that we cannot forego, otherwise we'll crash. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me to, let me go to you, Chang, for a minute more because uh, we're running out of time and uh, uh, I want to ask Russell to summarize and give us some, some advice going forward. But, but Chang, you know, uh, part, part of, uh, inherent part of the relationship between two countries or, or multilateral um, arrangements too uh, is business competition. And, and we've seen a, sort of a degradation of that uh, in the last four years under Trump. Um, and the question I, I suppose is, uh, can we achieve and how can we achieve a better, what do you want to call it? It's not just trade, but a business coexistence type relationship with China going forward. What does Biden do on that level? So again, we come back to my original argument and uh, empathy to understand how other people feel and how other people think. It's a, it's very it's a common misunderstanding that the uh, Chinese Chinese people don't uh, Chinese Chinese people want democracy and Chinese government against the democracy. But on the other, but uh, if you read that the the, uh, the Chinese constitution and if you read the proclamation from the Congress and the authority, you 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 read 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 between the lines that actually the government and the authority they know democracy is a good thing, but uh, the their argument is China is not ready for democracy that because of educational level because of mass population. So there is a very strong for 100 years, there is a there is a very strong pro American and a pro modernization and pro westernization thinking in the in the Chinese mainstream, uh, both the media and the government think tank and all the intellectual community. So we have to, we to so again, also, you know, if we only read that the, the very limited news report and what's, there's a natural disaster, there's a, a, a you know, a, some corruption in, in, in China, and we missed the whole picture, how China really is and, and and then we can't think like a chinese and we can't effectively communicate with chinese so that it i i was born and raised in china so i can i can testify that you know chinese before trump chinese people look at united states with admiration and uh, today chinese people look at the united states with with uh, sympathy and so there is a very little hostility toward the United States. If the US government and Biden administration and the Chinese, American people understand, there is a very little hostility from the China side. And the, probably that is the first step to rebuild the trust and to rebuild the relationship. Thank you, Chang. Well, what a discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, I'm, I'm happy that we've had this discussion, Russell. Uh, and now uh, I, could I ask you to summarize it and talk about what it means going forward? 
Well, like, Jay, I think what it means going forward is that, uh, like Chang had said, you know, there we, we got to have hope, and he's right. I think nobody knows really what's on Biden's mind. Um, everybody's taking uh, bits and pieces and trying to predict it. But I really think that um, that um, what we need to go for it, have hope, and what Alexander said is correct. I think that from the China side, the people are looking and saying, well, you know what? Even though they had this maybe abnormal period of time the last four years the system worked the rule law worked the the checks and balances worked you know i do teach uh course law courses and i get that question about the checks and balances and and we've seen that even the judges that were appointed by um trump uh follow the rule of law and the rule of law prevailed uh, the Electoral College uh, ran its route. Uh, so again, um, we have to faith in that. But I think above all, I think that American people don't understand the Chinese people. Um, I think that uh, we're also here um, looking at China and saying, you have to change and be like us. Remember, it's only been 40, last 40 years that they have um, have really moved toward the direction to giving a people a better life, education. They still haven't finished that route. We've taken over 200 something years, okay? So again, it's very difficult to place our thought in theirs. And I think, again, um, uh, and finally, I think the people of China, um, as Chang has said, and I think it's, it's exactly true with my observations. Uh, a lot of people still um, respect America um, and there's no hostility. I've uh, been there 18 years. I've never seen, heard anything that was hostile to America. Um, so I think that I'm confident with, with these things that um, the right thing is going to get done. But, but I think one thing that troubles me more, Jay, is that America, we need to look at ourselves. We need to do things and invest to make us more competitive. Okay. We can beat somebody on the head saying, you know, intellectual property theft, but we ourselves are not competitive anymore. And that's the problem. We're still in, uh, we're not technology, uh, you know, in the Midwest, a lot of places after you drop off the main turnpike, they've got these rural places. They don't have internet. Uh, the telephone uh, phone packages, you pay a hundred dollar a month for a family plan. They can't afford that. They don't have a cell phone and Americans use internet by taking your MacBook to go to Starbucks in, in China, you have internet everywhere, internet free people have smartphones. So again, uh, I think that um, to make us more competitive, that's what Biden should be doing also along this, because along this lines. Well, I would add that, um, you know, the bullet whizzed by our ear on November 3rd. It could have gone the other way. And uh, God knows what would have happened to us and the world if it had gone the other way. So yes, our democracy came through, but uh, it was not a, a foregone conclusion, and it isn't a foregone conclusion now. Our democracy, if we forget, we have to remember that it's fragile, and we have to work to keep it, and we have a lot of work to do. We also, we, all of us, all nations, have a lot of work to do to keep the world together in, in the same kind of fragility, especially with due regard to things like uh, viruses and, um, and uh, climate change. But I, uh, I'm hoping we can, all three of us, four of us, can get together again and continue this conversation. As you said, Alexander, uh, these, these are larger questions. They deserve more time. I hope we can do, we can give them more time. Uh, Alexander Morawa, uh, Chang Wang, Russell Liu, thank you so much for putting this together. Aloha, you guys, and Happy New Year. Thank you. And a Happy, happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year, Mary. Okay. Happy, happy New Year. Year.